Good evening and welcome everyone to the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Center for Thought and Culture. Oh, I'm really delighted that you're here tonight, and it's not just because of the caliber of our honored guests, Bishop Paul Tai and Father Robert Lauder, but it's because few, if any, events have, I think, spoken so directly to what the Sheen Center is all about. Um, the reason why we're here is, to borrow the words of Pope Paul VI, to reestablish the friendship between the church and artists. Artists can gain so much from the church, but as St. Pope John Paul II reminds us in his seminal letter, his letter to artists, the church also needs artists. Two, and I quote, translate into meaningful terms that which is in itself ineffable, end quote. Essentially to express mystery through words, shapes, sounds, and colors. One such artist, the Catholic poet Dana Joya, has defined culture as a conversation that a society has with itself. In other words, it's a dialogue. Which brings us to tonight's speaker, who in his role as Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture has encouraged just that, a dialogue between the church and the world, with art as the bridge. Before I welcome Bishop Tai up to the podium, let me tell you a little bit about Bishop Tai. Born and raised in Navan and Sligo in Ireland, he earned a law degree from University College Dublin. He was ordained in the Diocese of Dublin in 1983 and ordained a bishop in 2016. In 2007, he was appointed secretary of the Pontifical Council for Social Communications and was involved in the launch of several social media initiatives for the Holy See. Last year, he was appointed the secretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture, uh, and he has represented the Vatican at the Web Summit in Lisbon and at the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas. It is my distinct honor to welcome to the podium his Excellency, Bishop Paul Tai. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I have to warn you, as you probably see, somebody who has essentially studied law followed by moral theology is probably not the ideal person to take you into the arts. But, um, and one of my sisters, when I was appointed to the Vatican's Council for Culture, said to me, I see the Vatican want to go lowbrow, <laughs> and, um, and I can't apologize. It is slightly. This is What I've decided to do is to try and take you through something that I'm still working on. It's a work in progress, so we'll have time for questions. We'll have time for that. So a new way of seeing the church in the contemporary art and film. My method, I have here the Met and the Prado. That is, goes back to this time, about two years ago, I was visiting New York. I had four hours free, decided to visit the Met and ran around the place in a desperate effort to see everything. <laughs> Saw really nothing, and, um, but left kind of feeling guilty that, about the things I hadn't seen. About a year later, I was visiting the Prado Museum in uh, Madrid, which is an equally intimidating, and somebody had curated my tour for me and just brought me to see six paintings. And those six paintings, in a sense, were there to open my eyes to the whole story. So what you're going to get a little bit today is slightly more eclectic. I'm going to focus particularly on Irish contemporary art and some Irish cinema, not because I think it's any better than anything else, but because I know it. And also there's a little thing I always quote is, James Joyce lived in Rome for a very short time. He hated it. <laughs> but for his, the 100th anniversary of his birth in 1982, he was born in 1882, they put a plaque up to him on the Via Frattina in Rome. I was there. In fact, the only people there were nuns, priests, and seminarians, which I think would have given Joyce a bit of fun. But the plaque has a thing, and it says he, he in Ulysses, it says what he does is he makes of his Dublin our universe. And the artist can do that. Something very particular, something localized, can speak of something more general. So I'm hoping this somewhat random selection of my stuff will help you in a similar way. What is the church? I'm going to, for me, the church is the assembly, the people who have called called essentially by Christ because they have believed in his witness to the love of God for all people. Essentially, that's an essentially part of that then is the church is called to celebrate God's love 
and to bring it to other people. Little quotation from, and I want to give it because it's uh, the then Cardinal um, Montini, who became, of course, Paul VI, who is very much at the heart of this dialogue, once said, the church is nothing by itself. We shouldn't so much talk about that the church has Christ as that Christ has the church to carry his work of salvation to all. And this to all is what interests me a little bit. The council where I work is kind of council for culture was originally there for dialogue with unbelievers. It was set up by Vatican II to have the dialogue with people who would describe themselves as unbelievers or atheists. They don't tend to have representative groups, so the dialogue can become a little bit more difficult. But in a sense, Paul the Sixth, or John Paul II said, it's a dialogue that's happening in culture all the time. The conversation about who we are and how we understand stuff. And again, a lot of our work is promoting what Pope Francis calls the culture of encounter. How do people learn to see difference and diversity as a richness rather than as a threat or as something bad? So this brings me into all sorts of strange areas, south by southwest, where you spend your time walking around trying to make sure nobody gets a photograph of you with something that probably shouldn't <laughs> be behind you. And art, I'm going to take contemporary art. What I want to suggest is if we're thinking of the contemporary, of the here and now, we're still in what might be described as a postmodern age. There's no one story that everyone agrees on. The um, curator, former curator, director general of the British uh, Museum, um, McGregor, has done a very interesting program. It's called Living with the Gods. And he's taken about 50 objects, artifacts coming from religious background. He did a British Museum together with BBC. And he says, the reason I have to do it is society no longer has a story. It doesn't know, know how to think communally about who we are, our place in the cosmos, and our place in time. And I think art can be a barometer of that. And it's an interesting one to see how people are thinking and reflecting. And, that's, and I've put arts because you'll be getting a little bit of everything. At the core of what I'm using are a series of wonderful papal lectures and talks, starting with Pius XII, talking about the nature of artists, on to Paul VI, who was very much the one who wanted to restore relationship with artists, through John Paul II, into Benedict and into Francis. Francis, not as explicitly, but it's there, this interest in the arts. And I'd be not quoting them systematically. We're going to walk through this, and you'll see they're interspersed. Artists, and the two things I want to take about those paper discourse is extraordinary passionate. Paul VI gathers the artists in 1964 in the uh, Sistine Chapel, and he says, can we be friends again? The Pope would like to be able to call you friends again which is an extraordinary kind of thing. Can we heal what's gone wrong? The poetic then, for me, among the most extraordinary poetic discourses are some of these, where the popes, who were people touched by art, get very passionate. Particularly, I will listen to Pope Benedict on a number of times responding to musical pieces, and he took off. Like, it was into it. I was lost, but it, it, there was a sublime reality. And there's one time he sat at some concert, and he turned to the... Archbishop at church, and Lutheran Archbishop said, who couldn't believe in God as they listened to Bach? It's that sense of the wonder. One of the things these discourses talking about artists, what's extraordinary is the warmth of the language. They talk about the vocation, the genius, the artist who's searching. Also picking up the artist who's tormented, who's really trying to give his or her best, the authenticity and a concern for beauty. There's a category that's used that I think is an interesting one is it, particularly in John Paul II, he talks about the true artist. And the true artist is, he doesn't leave it, he's not going to define, but he says the true artist knows you have to be careful to avoid the temptation of what he calls empty glory, cheap popularity, or profit. But we leave it to artists to make that judgment. But there's a purity, there's a striving, there's an honesty, and then there's a recognition that artists are themselves product of a culture. So they're, they're going to reflect and come from what their particular experience is. Next bit now is a little bit risky, but a bit of fun here. I grew in a town called Navan in County Meath, and there were four major paintings on the church, on the back wall, at the, on the, behind the altar, but huge paintings. And this is one of them. They're, they're four evangelists. And this was done by an Irish artist called Richard King, done about 1950. He was a stained glass artist. Hugely influenced, I wasn't to know that as a child, El Greco and Ruo, the French artist. And this is 
just something that I grew up with. It was kind of touching my imagination. This is a very strike. It's the biggest art you could see in a rather mundane, business-like town where people were pragmatic and built furniture and got on with business. But this was an extraordinarily gracious thing to have, the vision of one priest who had decided it was something to have. This is my cinema credentials. <laughs> Pierce Brosnan was four years ahead of me at school. My mother claimed she babysat him one time. So that's... <laughs> Next is... This is 1967. This is a film none of you will probably have heard of. It was released in 1970, made by Blake Edwards, called Darling Lily, starring Julie Andrews and Rock Hudson. And they came to the small town of Navan in 1967. And these two... Giants, and there were more innocent time. We were all imagining love affairs and things. But these two giants were walking around our town. So we had Mary Poppins, Maria von Trapp, wandering around the town, and a fired in imagination. But also we went out every Sunday, every weekend, to watch the making of the film. So you realize it's made. There's an art. This is a painter, an Irish painter I like. This is a guy called Sean McSweeney. My family moved to Sligo when I was about 12. Sligo is known as the Yates County. It's a very, very beautiful part of Ireland. Features beauty. If you've seen the film Calvary, that's where the film was made. I'll be quoting it. Extraordinary beauty. But this artist, landscape artist, began painting not so much the mountains, the lakes, but what he found at his feet. And he saw, in Ireland, we have a thing called bog, bog wool. It's kind of a flowery thing, but it looks like a cotton, bog cotton. And he just starts looking very close at what's right in front of his eyes and begins working and painting. You recognize influence by Hodgkins and other British artists, but extraordinary use of color, beautiful detail. But his self-avowed thing was to make us open our eyes, see what's there below us. And this in an extraordinarily beautiful place. He was saying, don't lose the other picture. I want to link with that something that I think the role of the artist. Seamus Heaney has to be quoted in any Irish talk, but Seamus Heaney has a wonderful collection of poems called Seeing Things. And in Irish dialogue, if you talk about seeing things, it's kind of a way of madness if he's seeing things, he's imagining. It's not, so there's an ambiguity in what he's doing. But he has one of his poems, and the subtitle of it is Claritas. And he's initially standing in front of a church, looking at this facade of the church, where there's a carving of the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. And he describes the extraordinary details of the carving. Everything is there. But he has this, he says, in, yet in that utter visibility, the stone's alive with what is invisible. That's seeing that little more. This is Jack Hannon. Again, not a particularly renowned artist. But this was when I went into the seminary in Dublin. This man was a priest in Dublin who was also an artist, trained in the French school in Dublin, which had kind of brought French art into the Dublish, Dublin environment. Again, you can see a lot of stained glass influence. Art, like art hinted to be a lot of stained glass. But this was a guy who, kind of the idea of priest and artist was of interest here. And that leads me to one of Paul VI's thoughts. Paul VI said, if we didn't have artists, priests would have to become artists. Because what we're trying to communicate, what we're trying to give to people, is something about an intuitive beauty. And priesthood would have to coincide with art if we didn't have the artists. Thankfully, we don't have to rely on the artistic ability of most priests. They can be complemented and we can work with it. Another artist in the seminary, because this is a man called Patrick Pye, died a month ago. Um, very probably one of the better Irish contemporary artists, but not necessarily appreciated because he is explicitly religious in his painting. And that's just one thing. I just wanted to use his thing to say a thing. When we talk about religion and art, there are kind of categories. There's the believer who is self-consciously making religious art. There's the believer who's doing that using religious themes, or it could be using a secular theme, but where the motivation is to communicate a religious idea. Then there's also the great religious themes, the biblical scenes, which can be painted by artists who be believers or not believers. There's another category which I think is the artist whose art is kind of somehow drawing us beyond ourselves, what the British tend to call the sublime. It's bringing us into a different area. Another category is one that I think is interesting is 
and this will be explored in the Met soon in their looking at fashion, the Catholic imagination. People who have grown up Catholic, who may or may not still be Catholic, who may reject very much what they've had, and yet people say, it's there. It's marking everything they do. I think we'll see a little bit of that along the way. Just again, other great artist has to be quoted, Irish Oscar Wilde. I think he said, art cannot tell us what to believe, but it can tell us what it feels like to believe. So that brings us to a feeling of strength. This is another Irish, needless to say, artist, Tony O'Malley, who would be described by most people as an abstract artist. This is a, a scene he did called Breakfast in the Bahamas. But in all of Tony O'Malley, I got to know Tony O'Malley because a friend of mine who's a lot wealthier than I collected his stuff and gave me to mind one of it. So I lived for about two years with the Tony O'Malley. And it was kind of a dark one. This is a nice one. But one of the things he always has, angelic wings. Doesn't matter what the paint, there's something there that he's pointing at more. And he himself has this thing where he said, He's not trying to be an abstract. He's not abstract for the sake of being abstract. He wants to get to the essence. And he says what abstract art can do is it takes us under the surface, beyond the appearances, and it expresses the mind. OK, back now to direct the church needs artists. This is a theme that is very strong in why the church needs artists. Um, John Paul II developed this in a way. In a sense, we can talk about historic alliance. It was artists who built our churches, who are are adorned our churches, who helped us to create the music that we could celebrate our liturgy, who enriched this translator, who translate the ineffable into more tangible signs, symbols, words, and music, who are making visible. The other thing that, and this is a Paul VI thought, he said, they're able to express mystery. And he uses this German term, einfühling, which best translation, it's like musical empathy, what music can do to your soul. Art can stir up something within the soul. And again, this is, I think he says this is important because fundamentally our faith, our believing, is not about assent to intellectual propositions, true or false propositions, but it's about an activity, a communal way of activity, of understanding and finding a way of living together. And art can help us to, to give us that point and meaning. Downside of the story, I, I don't usually like reading quotations, but I, two or three I'm just going to read you. One is on the rupture. Where did the separation come from? Why did the separation? Yesterday, my boss, uh, Cardinal Ravazzi, launched a project uh, for the Venice Biennale, but the Biennale of Architecture. We've sponsored 10 chapels. They're going to build 10 chapels on the island of San Giorgio, one by an American New York um, there are two architects with the same name, Andrew Berman, who's worked mainly in Connecticut, but also Norman Foster is there, a number of Japanese. So, and they've all been asked to think about building religious spaces. And they're building not models, but actual chapels. They're small, and this is... But in that talk he was giving yesterday, Ravazzi talked about where did contemporary art and the church lose each other? On the one side, art left the temple. The artist had placed the Bible on a dusty shelf to pursue instead the secular road of modernity, often fleeing the use of figures, symbols, narrations, and sacred words. Indeed, artists often considered the message as an ideological gallows and instead dedicated themselves to stylistic exercises that were more and more elaborate and self-referential or even sometimes desecrating provocations. He said, art was entrusted to an esoteric criticism that was incomprehensible to most people and became enslaved by the ways and means of a market that, which was often artificial and even excessive. On the other side, theology looked almost exclusively to systematic speculation that believes it has no need of signs or metaphors. It too had put into storage the great repertoire of Christian symbols. In the ecclesial sphere, there was a return to copying the past, not going with what was new, safe bets, not paying enough to get the good art. And finally, he says, at a times, buying into the worst of what was contemporary art in some of our churches, particularly with the brutality, the kind of functionalism, 
but not really capturing the best of art. So that's an explanation of this rupture. As I say, Paul VI trying to say, let's get back to a notion of a friendship. Not as a historical accident, not as a practical need that we'll pay you to do commission work from you, but because there's something rooted in the essence between religious expression and artistic creativity. Again, here, just the second quotation I want to read you is from Benedict talking to pilgrims or talking to tourists in Rome. So it's an audience he gave in 2011, essentially tourists who are coming to Rome. And he said, it may have happened that on some occasion you paused before a sculpture, a picture, a few verses of a poem or a piece of music that you found deeply moving, that gave you a sense of joy, a clear perception that is, that what you believed was not only matter, a piece of marble or bronze, a painted canvas, a collection of letters or an accumulation of sounds, but something greater, something that speaks, that can touch the heart, communicate a message, uplift the mind. A work of art is a product of the create, creative capacity of the human being who in questioning visible reality seeks to discover its deep meaning and to communicate it through the language of forms, color and sound. Art is able to manifest and make visible the human need to surpass the visible. It expresses the thirst and the quest for the infinite. The sense of appreciation that we're in the same business almost. We're, we're exploring mystery together. Vatican II also then having affected that by a say where the church began to say, let's try to grow an appreciation of what's outside us, not just what we have to give the world, but to appreciate and understand the goodness of what is in the world. Sometimes people talk about it almost like a filter. We can see great goodness. We may have to filter it, it might be pure, but it's, we start with appreciation. We don't start with condemnation. Again, the expressiveness of art, as I think this thing I've said to you before, the register, it's a way of registering where people are, what they're thinking of. It can speak to us in all sorts of ways, and it invites us to know people, to know the artists, but to know the world that they are trying to represent. And this is where Pope Francis has a kind of, as I say, not somebody who has done it yet, at least, a huge amount. In the Vatican, he's made it clear he won't be going to concerts musically concerts, he's kind of just made it clear. He's resisted a lot of deliberate and intentional, and I, I'm boasting here, but I met with him last week and I said I was coming here and I was doing this talk and he smiled at me and he wished me good luck. <laughs> and, and he said, it's very important to be there, he said, because the question he put to me, he said, is we're missing the church, we're not present where culture is being formed, where contemporary culture is emerging, we're not there and get out there and do it, was his basic line. But I think he wrote in Laudato Si, talking about the environment, and he said one of the things that's needed is that people get a better aesthetic education. And he says, by learning to see and appreciate beauty, we learn to reject self-interested pragmatism. If someone has not learned to stop and admire something beautiful, we should not be surprised if he or she treats everything as an object to be used and abused without scruple. So this is again Pope Francis. He has this thing, Pope Benedict was always against relativism. He says, I want to be against practical relativism. What, what follows? And this is one of his things. How are we going to find a way of being able to stop and value what's around us? And this is the thing that I want to just pick up here very much in the thought of Benedict, but as Cardinal Ratzinger some years before he became Pope, did this wonderful talk in Rimini in which he talked about art. And one of the great things he said art can do, it can shock us. It wakens us up. He talks, it breaks us from the resignation or the humdrum. And it's, it's a kind of a painful at times, but it has a capacity to waken us up. And he quotes then, of course, the Dostoevsky thing, you know, we can live about many things, but we can't live without beauty. Just want to take one artist. This is the non-Irish artist, but I claim him because it's Bill Viola, because he also worked with us in the Vatican on our first um, entrance into the Vatican, into the Biennale, and I let him do the talking. It's easier. The works engage with a multinational audience, keeping with a spiritual environment that attracts people of all faiths, says Viola's partner Kira Peroff. 
that's not just a Christian or point of view or a Islamic point of view or any religious point of view at all actually. It's really something uh, where um, the forces of nature take over and the force of nature is also death. It's a slow motion piece. The intention is not only to slow down the action on screen, but for the viewer as well. Well, we, we're trying to slow people down. The, the world has gotten too fast, literally. I mean, it is, it is now, I believe, really out of control. And I think we have to be very careful. That's why there's so many people now who really are trying to practice yoga and meditation. And the Dalai Lama says that all the time. This thing slow down. I think in a digital culture, which is my own working background, but clearly not a digital native, but it's the one I've been working in. And in the Vatican, for example, we would have worked very strongly to encourage people to be in the digital because we didn't want to be seen as Luddites <laughs> against the... But we're meeting a younger generation of Catholics who are saying to us, no, no, we also need to be helped to not be at the mercy of the latest post, of having to respond, of being on all the time, of being able to... And I think Viola, something that's slow down. Second clip from Viola, just again a great explanation from him. Well, martyrs is a really, really, really special, special thing. I mean, there are, there are martyrs large and small. I mean, a mother who cares for her child, you know, is a kind of martyr because she's being really taken over by that child. She would do anything to protect that child. And there was times when we couldn't do it. You know, it seemed like we were on the cliff and we were about to be just say, okay, sorry, it didn't really work, you know. And that happened multiple times, but somehow, somewhere, and I don't know if I should evoke God here, but it seemed like it, at certain key moments, just when you thought you were gonna be this is it, it's finished, we're never going to do it, something would happen. I, it, this is the best installation of, of moving image video art that I have ever made. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't get better than this, that's all I can say. We would like to think his piece for the Vatican was better, but anyway. <laughs> Interesting here again, just the sense of the his reticence even to acknowledge belief in God, which I, I think is an interesting feature in our culture, and I'll come back to that later on. I want to move now just simply, and I'll take fairly quickly here, is to what you find, not explicitly, but there's clear theological foundation for why we can find value, meaning, and purpose in art, and why Christians in particular should be able to see that. One is, I think, if we begin with our creation story, our belief is that all of creation was made by God. Therefore, the beauty of nature, the beauty of art, has a way of speaking to us about God. Again, he was in Eng born in England but worked in Ireland. Hopkins, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. How can we see God's beauty in the world around us? The Christian anthropology, which is our belief that everybody is made in God's image and likeness. Whether he or she is a believer or not, made in God's image and likeness, and then somehow deep down wired to want to be loved and wired also to want to give themselves in love. And therefore, great art, will, great beauty can speak even to the one who won't recognize where the source of that might be, but can put somebody on a path to something deeper because it's, it's in our DNA, is a physical, but it's in our existential DNA, if that's not a, a contradiction in terms. I think something about creativity, and there's some great stuff on this, where human beings are at their most wonderful when they get into their creativity. And if we're made in the image and likeness of God, and if our God is creative, maybe it's in our creativity that humans begin to most show their God-likeness. It's interesting in the scientific areas, um, you get this thing very often where people will say about new developments, don't try and play God. Bioethicists, I know, would always say, no, no, do. But do what you're doing with the love God had for creation. <laughs> In other words, do your creativity. Even when we use scientific creativity, which seems to be, is a gift from God. It's something that we came, but do it with that respect that was part of the feature of God's creation, his love for creation. 
I think the incarnation, our belief that Jesus Christ is truly God and true man, means that he reveals what God is, who God is, the absolute nature of the unconditional and undeniable and unmerited love that God has for each and every one of us, but he also shows us what a human person is and can be. And therefore, that sense of Irenaeus had that the glory of God is the human person fully alive. So I think these are kind of saying to us, let's watch, let's see how art can speak to us. The life, death and resurrection is one interesting, Pope Benedict confronted the thing, people said, art and religion can both be forms of escapism. He said no, and he, he takes up precisely images of the suffering Christ in art. And he says there's a beauty in the horrificness of those images, because it's a beauty that says love goes to this end. It's in the martyr thing down there of Viola as well. The giving of yourself to another person as somehow being the grounding and what gives purpose and meaning to life. And in the darkness of the face of Christ, in the pain and in the horror, somehow reveals the absolute beauty of God's unconditional love. The idea of interiority, turning inside ourselves, which is kind of, is also going to be enriching. Pius XII picked that up. Pius XII then had this lovely thing. He said, there's nothing that's exclusively human. There's nothing that's only natural. There's nothing that's purely imminent. Everything in the created world has the capacity to speak to us of God. Pope um, Benedict, again, in saying to artists, look, work, 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 and don't be afraid of faith. He has this thing, he says, faith will take nothing away. It won't necessarily add anything on. In moral theology, often we talk about the distinction between what is specifically Christian ethics. Our behavior should be that of good people. We may be Christian or not Christian. The specificity may come level at the motivation. So artists needn't fear that somehow an engagement with Christianity is somehow lessening of their art. The one, I think, is our notion of the spirit. But this idea of the God who can surprise us, the God who can be found in the unusual places, the openness to other, the biblical tradition, the prophecies coming from the most unlikely sources, the surprises and the unexpected. And I think this is one where we can sometimes wait for art to open our eyes and give us insights that are very welcome. So again, Carl Jung's well-known bidden or not bidden, God is present. And now I'm going to take you a little, not quite high risk, but I'm going to take you into um, an artist, um, Martin McDonough. And it's Martin McDonough's film, In Bruges. And In Bruges, trying to find a clip that didn't have a lot of very vulgar language has not been easy, but we found something <laughs> where I think it's been somewhat reduced to the minimum. Um, but um, this is um, our Irish idiom anyway. And the first thing I want to look at is where the story of In Bruges, how many of you have seen the film? Have you? No, it's about two Irish IRA men who are doing a contract killing of a priest. They kill the priest, but accidentally kill a child. The, their minders who had paid for the contract send them off to Bruges to hide them until this. But Bruges becomes a metaphor for purgatory. And it's all about judgment, the guilt, what's going to happen. And the two actors are two extraordinary actors, Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell. And this is a Colin Farrell that you won't recognize. <laughs> Um, and it's extraordinary, and basically Colin Farrell is, Bruges is hell, it's not even purgatory. And Gleeson is trying to edge him along. This scene is when they visit the Groningen Museum in Bruges and they come across three great paintings. The first painting we see is one about the death and the miser, where the death is coming to collect his Jews and he has a list, which is the second piece, film uh, clip we see, is, or this picture we encounter, is the death of a corrupt judge who was basically skinned alive. <laughs> and then finally, there's the great Bosch, the last judgment. And we let them talk for themselves. One reference you need to know is Tottenham is an English soccer team who are not particularly distinguished. But this is followed by a scene where the older man is asked to go and kill the younger guy. He gets his instructions. The younger guy is the guy who's killed. He runs with a gun, he's running up to kill him when he decides that the younger guy is about to commit suicide because he's feeling so guilty about everything. 
and then he tries to stop him committing suicide, although the irony is he was on his way to kill him. And we get this dialogue that is interesting again, and this is, what I want to say is, this is kind of dark humor, but it's, I mean, it's opening themes and discussions that you couldn't probably open up in an earnest way at times in our society. And now I want to do a little one. We talked about the church needs artists. This is one I think more important, because it's not just about us, is the world needs artists. And we need that new way of seeing, the going deeper. We also, the capacity of artists sometimes to help us to see into the life of another person. Very different, good novelist, good filmmaker, can bring us into sympathy for somebody with whom we wouldn't naturally have sympathy. And I think this is something to be, it's interesting, I just watched on the plane over, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, which is Martin McDonough's better known and more recent. And a couple of things about that is, it's extraordinary. Nobody is black, all black or nobody is all white. Everybody is mixed emotionally. He, min he, re he succeeds in making us even feel a certain sympathy for characters that are thoroughly unsympathetic. Ambivalence he plays with. Interesting scene that I cop, not everybody did, is when he be at the beginning of the film when the central character is going in to lease the billboard, she goes into the advertising agency and the young guy, Red, is reading a book, and it's Flannery O'Connor. So I think we're, we're getting our messages here. OK, another thing I want to think about artists is gift and gratuity. Artists, and, artists do art for art's sake, and that is a contradiction to a market-led world when done properly is something to be valued. I want to talk about the via negativa, and I want to stop on this one for a second, because it's worth a little bit of time, is in an awful lot of contemporary art, it's dark. And I think this reflects our postmodern, where there's an effort to be shocking. There's an effort to be skepticism. It's interesting, Pope Benedict has this thing, skepticism good, cynicism bad. That is not the only way of telling truth is by deconstructing the truth, the false truths. It's an important part. But let's not routinely give up on the possibility of beauty. I think another thing that's a feature of a lot of contemporary art and cinema in particular is it's ironic. There's subversion, there's irony going on. We tend to be very literal people. <laughs> We're earnest. We have something very meaningful. One of the, even some of the films that have been made of a more explicitly Christian Catholic nature, their earnestness won't get traction necessarily with the why. I sat through a couple of them in my time that, and afterwards I better not name any, but... Uh, there is it, and humor. But one of the things that John Paul II had very clearly, he said, look, even the darkest art, we can see it as an appeal for salvation. It's looking for redemption somewhere. So, and I'll pick this up again in some of the scenes we're going to see. I think one of the things art does, it can permit a more serious conversation. It's interesting, I don't know in this part of the world, but in Ireland, book clubs and people coming together to engage with art, to share ideas and have a kind of conversation that might, in other words, happen. I think a feature of our age is reticence. We saw that in by Viola. You don't want to necessarily say what you believe. It's not really cool to be a believer. It's a very young, very interesting young Irish novelist, Sally Rooney, reviewed in the New Yorker quite recently, 26 years of age, very contemporary Ireland. And she has her heroine totally out of church and no mention of church, but reading the gospel at night because she's looking for something, but very clear that she couldn't tell anyone about it. So this is kind of a reticence. And I think even interesting, McDonough, uh, the, the, one, the other Michael, John Michael McDonough, who made a film called Calvary, which is a very religious theme. No, I'm not talking about Catholicism. I'm not talking about the church. I'm not talking about child abuse. You know, you, you can't say you are. Brendan Gleeson, when interviewed after playing this role of a priest that we're going to see in a moment, said, I refuse to say whether I'm a believer or a non-believer. Because if I say I'm a believer, they'll all say I'm going soft on the church. And if, they say, if I say I'm a non-believer, they'll all say I'm going too hard on the church. So this kind of reticence that is a feature of some art. But what I want to do simply is the mystery, the invitation into the mystery and no manipulation. One of the things that I think um, I felt I should reference here is I grew up with... 1979 was my 21st birthday. So the present I got was Parallel Lines by Blondie, CBGB Club. So I have to reference my debt to the Ramones and to the area we're in now. 
and also a group called the Stranglers, who had that great one, No More Heroes. And that's kind of a feature. You can't have heroes. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip along through um, a couple of clips now very quickly, but I'll talk them through rather than play them, unfortunately, but they, they will be great, but we're timing in respect. One is U2, their latest album, Bono confronting the fact that he's getting older, has a song called The Little Things That Give You Away, and he talks about the experience of waking four in the morning and being frightened. And he says in his commentary on it, I'm preaching to myself that I'm really preaching to myself. Four in the morning, I think for most of us, we'll call back Philip Larkin, obeyed, that wakening in the night, and he says the fear of all the things that are always there, but we're busy enough that we can avoid them. We don't have to think about them. Suddenly, we have to confront them. And then finally, his more redemptive piece, where he comes true into a, an understanding of Larkin, has, Larkin, this very cynical kind of misanthropic, always on the dark side, in a great poem called Church Going, has this idea that somehow people will always visit old ruined churches because they'll be forever surprising in a hunger in themselves for something deeper. So I think this yearning that we should be tapping into, that's, that artists will help us to get to. So and moving quickly through here, encounter. I want to close on this one. Part of what we're trying to do is encourage an encounter between the artists and the church between faith. Part of what we would like to do in our council in Rome is to encourage this to happen. It's part of Pope Francis's thing of let's build a, a, a culture of encounter where people listen to another one another, learn from one another, grow in confidence in their friendship with one another so they can be authentically share their thoughts and ideas. And there are various ways in which that can be done. I want to end up with a series of paintings by, I think, one of the more interesting experiments. This is, again, a great Irish painter, Sean Scully. Sean Scully, who, to tie it all together, was also is collected by Bono, who is a series of wonderful discussions he has with an extraordinary art critic called Arthur Don Danto, who's exploring this thing of the meaning of art. And he's an abstract expressionist. And he's a very robust and unusual character. The interesting thing about Scully is, like the McDonough brothers, he's Irish but grew up in Britain and has something of an outsider's view. And basically, one of the wonderful things that happened is Montserrat Abbey outside Barcelona has a great art collection, and he had a piece in it. Talking with one of the curators, the idea came that he would fill an old 12th century romance, romance church. And he's filled it with this wonderful expressionist art. So this is one painting that is, this is called Holly, which was his mother's maiden name. His mother died, and when he went to tidy up at her bedside, he found the Stations of the Cross. And this is his creation of the Stations of the Cross. And he has this notion that in the color and in the dancing and in the movement of the color, there's his mother who gave her life in so many ways for him. And he has this just of, if we can look at the stations of the cross, he says, if, and the, 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 what he has written under it is amazing. The pains and sorrow of mankind focused on the cross of Christ from whence comes health, life, and peace. Now, at the same time, he wants to say, I'm not necessarily a believer. He describes himself, well, I'm kind of Catholic, but I'm Zen. He has one great one. He says, I'm circling, and if I can find the right airport, I'll land, you know. <laughs> which, but it, gathering the light, he uses light all the time. And this is a, he's, they say, probably the person who's most faithful to the inspiration of Kandinsky. He himself identifies with that tradition. He talks about an inner necessity to paint. That stuff, the struggle that the popes were talking about. He talks about how, I need my glasses, unfortunately, <laughs> how he talks as non-denomination religious art, is what he said. And he just feels people need light, they need color, and this is part of what he's doing here. This is one called Santa Cecilia, which is again where he says, I'm trying to get at deep emotions through simple forms. A lot of his paintings have this juxtaposition of coloring, which is coming from experiences of color he had in Morocco, 
when he went to study where Matisse had learned to paint or had done a lot of his best work. And he marries it to, if you know Irish, the Iron Islands of the west of Ireland, the walls made with stones. And, he, and that's giving him the shape. And he's marrying the, the color with the austere. And he's just playing, but I think trying to evoke something in the spirit. This is one on mystery, where he's saying, again, he says, I want to induce you to meditate to structure the world in perfect communion. This is his own idea. And yet he's claiming, I'm not a believer. I'm not, a, you know, great. But um, if, you know, if he's not a believer, well, then there's hope for all of us. <laughs> and this is the final one I want to finish because it brings us back to Pope Benedict's idea of the cross and the face of Christ and the ugliness of that being the ultimate transmission of beauty because it shows God's fidelity. And what he's done here is... He's taken steel cross and wrapped it in blue glass. And what he says is he has the roughness of the steel shrined in the beauty of the light and the blue. And he said this is, also he says, this is Mary. This is Mary who filters the harshness of the cross for us. And then he ends this, asked the most mysterious one, he was asked, who's the biggest influence in your art? He said, my grandmother. She said she had seven children, and she could keep her faith in difficulty. And that's why this is his tribute to her. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bishop, as advertised. Uh, thank you for those profound and thought-provoking insights. And we're, it's now my honor to uh, introduce Father Robert Lauder. He is a publisher of 15 books, including his most recent book, Pope Francis, Profound Personalism and Poverty. He is uh, a mentor to me and uh, a dear friend. So please uh, join me in welcoming Father Robert Lauder. I'm trying to figure out what we should focus on, Bishop. Some of those, uh, some of those paintings were absolutely magnificent, especially the last one, the, uh, the, the blue cross. So that was great. Yeah, no, I think this guy, Scully, is, is really interesting. And one interesting thing he has, I mean, he's... He's irrepressible, but he talks about, he says, look, what made him an artist? He has this sort of thing, I'd prefer to die than live in the suburbs. Now, this is, <laughs> you know, I want to live intensely. Now, for most of us who live in the suburbs, if not geographically, at least with a certain safety, he's, you know, he's tough going. The other thing he's very clear on, he talks about how he became an artist. He said his parents moved to London when he was about eight and put him in a Catholic school. And then they had a fight with the Reverend Mother and with the parish priest, and he was taken out of the Catholic school and moved into a state school. And he said, I left a world of mystery and magic and rosaries and painting and art and beauty, and I suddenly found in this dull world, which is a bit overstated. But he said, what I really wanted to do from then on was to bring something of mystery and of beauty to people who lived in that somewhat duller world. And I think his colour thing... And this is an interesting also little quote on Martin McDonough, who left, in a sense, being an extraordinarily successful playwright, Cripple of Inish Man, Beauty Queen of Linan, some of them made them here to Broadway, extraordinary playwright. And he then said, no, I want to do cinema. Now, his cinema is very dramatic and it's all in the word, but he wanted to do cinema. Two reasons, he said. One is, I want to reach a wider public and I want to meet, reach a more critical public because he said if people have spent, spent over 100 sterling to come and see the theatre, they're going to be inclined to like it. <laughs> so he said, I want a more democratic judgment. So I think yeah. one of the things where I'll really link on that is that kind of this desire to, and it's one of my own <laughs> things, I can't really do the, the deeper end of the market, but I do think we need to reflect more on how we bring beauty, art, not just in religion, we have the risk of becoming a little elite that's not engaging the world. I think sometimes artists have that same little risk if we're not careful. Yeah, I, I think one thing we ought to, one response we should make to the bishop is, how do we do that in our own lives? How do we keep in touch with great literature, great film, um, great theater, and so on? Uh, we, we, we need it, and uh, we'll be playing a role in, in, in raising the level, I think. Let me share one experience I had with Art, and I'm sure everybody here could. Uh, I was in Paris, first time I was in Paris, I was determined to see the Mona Lisa. And I had an appointment at 4.30, and I got to the Louvre, and I was, this is about, 
This is about 40 years ago. I still remember this, running up the steps to get into the room. I get into the room. The Mona Lisa was maybe 15 yards away from me, and there was a crowd in front of, in front of the painting. I was out of breath. I looked at my watch. It was five after four, and I had an appointment in another part of Paris at 4.30. I said, well, I've, I can't. I have five minutes anyway, but I, at last, I've, I've seen. There it is, the Mona Lisa. There it is, the Mona Lisa. And I thought, well, if I'm completely honest, I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, she's got that dumb grin on her face, okay? And I said, well, I better get, well, um, let me, I'm, I'm moving now, and she's looking at me. Well, that's something. Um, Although I could probably get that at Coney Island, too. Okay. <laughs> Five times I tried to leave the room, and I could not. Finally, at 4.30, I said, oh, let him wait for me. I'm with the Mona Lisa. <laughs> she, she became every female I'd ever met in my life. And that's, that's the magic and the mystery. That, that, that can happen over and over again. I'm sure maybe in a couple of minutes you can share some of your experiences. Yep. Uh, one parallel one that, that, that is in Dublin for the... Um, it was a decision was made for the millennium for the year 2000 that we would have a new public art piece. I don't know if any of you know Dublin, and in best Dublin tradition, it was actually ready in 2001. But anyway, <laughs> um, but what it is is a spire. It's a stainless steel spire in the middle of O'Connell Street, and the first thing the practical people of Dublin would have asked, "What's it for? What does it mean?" You know. Um, because Dublin had a heroin problem at the time, people called it the needle in the middle or something like that, you know, which was uh, the spire. But what it has done, it's a very interesting thing, is two or three of the main shopping streets converge on the point where it is. It draws your eyes up. It actually, if there is sun, and that's uh, somewhat miraculous sometimes <laughs> in Dublin, but when there's sun, it captures that sun. And you're, right, you're walking down one of the grottier shopping streets, and almost inevitably, your eyes are brought up. Now, it's not the artist had no intention, he's very clear, to be religious, but somehow how the thing that can lift us out of the ordinary, and I think that's, again, the testimony to what art can, just somehow, yeah, yeah. lightens it up yeah. for me. But I think what we should ask ourselves after an evening like this is, what am I doing in, in my life uh, to experience beauty better, uh, deep, more deeply, and so on. Uh, I've been involved in two apostles, as uh, David said. I run film festivals. I've shown over 300 classics. Now, uh, the first night I had 700 people. Now I get maybe 50 people. But I have the feeling, well, it's there. At least it's there if anybody is interested. And we've, we've read, believe it or not, over 150 Catholic novels. Uh, once again, it's a handful of people. But it's something. I don't think we should you know, uh, worry about numbers. Uh, we keep the process going in any way we possibly can. Benedict had this conviction that we need to enrich public discourse, that we have to create arenas and fora where people who are different, who have different ideologies, different religious beliefs or no religious beliefs, can actually come together and share a space and enrich common life. He used the image of the courtyard of the Gentiles, which was in Jerusalem. You had the temple, and the temple was reserved for the Jewish people. But the courtyard or the piazza outside, they mixed with everybody else. And that's where, in a sense, the Jewish people, together with the different faiths and no faiths or whatever, had to trash out the common life of the city. Because, you know, how are we going to make water go? How are we going to get sanitation in the... In a, in a very, very old city, requ required everyone's cooperation. So Pope Benedict used this idea of the courtyard of the Gentiles as an image, he said, for creating conversations about culture and about the life we share together. He asked my boss, Cardinal Ravazzi, to develop an initiative to promote what he called the courtyard of the Gentiles. And being honest, in it, it works well as a title. I'm not, I think it's, in America it could be more, because it could be seen we're trying to exclude some if it's only the courtyard of the Gentiles. Um, but what it, the idea is essentially is using this as a model where you, you create an event, which could be a conversation or it could be an art exhibition or it can be a film show, but an event where you bring together people who declare themselves or acknowledge themselves to be believers, maybe of different faiths, and people who self-identify as not being believers. But they come together 
not to talk about belief and non-belief, but to talk about how are we going to confront together problems that are real for all of us. So how do we think about the environment? What does a religious perspective bring? What would a non-religious perspective appreciate in that or maybe want to bring another voice to that discussion? How do we think about economics? How do we think about um, the importance of art and music? So this is, it's almost like a franchise. Anybody in the world can take this and say, we'd like to do a courtyard of the Gentiles. What will distinguish it is you'll have believers and non-believers. But the topic and what it'll focus on, so for example, the city of Berlin, which is probably the most atheistic city in Europe because of the uh, communist background, and also it's a little bit of a mega for all free thinking young people in Europe is where they want to go, had a series of events, looking at art, looking at music, Berlin is rich in these things, thinking about politics, thinking about culture, and over a week had various events, all of which were trying to see how do we get the religious voices into dialogue with the non-religious voices so we can work together to think about how we make this world a better place for all. I would like to thank Bishop Tai and Father Lauder uh, for reminding us uh, that art, uh, to use Pope Paul VI word, are not only can be friends, but are friends. So thank you for the conversation. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you.